things reside in your system. And same applies to mobile phones as well. WhatsApp messages, SMSs and all that. So what exactly happens if this is the scenario, please take into account that once you are doing an investigation, please do explore the possibility of how to gather an electronic evidence. And electronic evidence, what we in our terminology we call forensic technology, the use of forensic technology and forensic technology experts in investigations to help us assist the fraud investigation investigator to gain that evidence. So what is forensic technology? It's collecting and preserving of electronically stored information. It helps to collect and recover digital evidence. Obtaining digital ev evidence mainly involves imaging of the digital storage media and records on different data computing machines. I'll briefly discuss about what is the difference between taking a backup and the imaging. Backup is dumping of the data file on some backup medium, such as USB and all that. Backup only provides copy of the documents and files which existed at the time when the backup was taken. In case a file is accessed after, the, after taking the backup, and it's not being actually uploaded in a proper forensic technology tools, the ex, you, you access a file, the date of modification can, can be used against you. Done, dusted, finished. I've seen a lot of cases, you go on to an investigation and the clients and a lot of the people say, oh, we have searched the machine, we have done this, nothing can be found, can you please now image the machine and see the data? I never touch those machines at all. N at all, never do that. Because now uh, you can insert a USB, you can copy a data. You can insert a USB, you can copy a data into an individual machine as well. An employee has left one month back, the machine kept on accessing till, 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 the, till the very next month and then the next month you start framing a charge against that individual, the data is completely being compromised. So, so I, I would certainly would like to emphasize this fact that I don't mean that if you intend to take electronic evidence as part of your investigation, just be very cautious of that fact. Accept backup files is not acceptable as evidence in any court of law. So then what you need to do? You need to image a machine. And when we say what is imaging, imaging is representation or reproduction of an object form. Imaging retrieves all data files from machine if they were deleted. Imaging does not modify file creation dates and is acceptable in the court of law. And that's all about from my side of the presentation in terms of going into the methodology side, how do you conduct an investigation? My friend Zishan will take it forward. So I'll just state, uh, I've just briefed on some of the key concepts on, on fraud, misconduct, the framework, the objectives of investigations, the key challenges in the mandate, and be mindful of the fact that we need to obtain electronic evidence when we conduct an investigation. Thank you very much, please. Thank you, Tala. To share his thoughts uh, on uh, the practical approach and challenges towards fraud investigation, I would like to call on stage our next speaker, uh, Mr. Zishan Shahid, partner Deloitte to Yusuf Adil. His profile can be seen on the screen. We had a session. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, in Lahore, we had a detailed session and it was planned on Saturday. So probably Saturday is the better day to plan than a work day, especially after the, you know, when the weekend is just starting. Anyways, my uh, topic for today in relation to the seminar on uh, fraud examination was to discuss the practical approach of how to carry out a fraud investigation and to discuss some of the challenges that are being faced by practically with the organizations. Starting with a quote by Samuel Johnson. Fraud and falsehood only dread examination, truth in white said. That is uh, the psychology when we deal with fraud examinations, we can gauge, uh, there's a whole concept of profiling of the investigator. We can gauge what kind of people 
are giving what kind of responses and uh, there's whole science behind it. Two brief topics, an overview of the process and the practical challenges. Let's just give a brief overview of what type of fraud do occur. Now fraud uh, has three main dimensions where fraud occurs. There is corruption, there is asset misappropriation and then there is financial statement fraud. The next slide may not be that visible but there are different dimensions to corruption as well. There are conflicts of interest both in private sector and public sector. It's not just a, corruption is not just a public sector phenomena or it is very much prevalent in private sector as well. Bribery too, uh, it is a private sector phenomena as well. Illegal gratuities, economic extortion even. Asset misappropriation is not just a physical asset, it can be of cash, it can be of inventory or any other asset. And then financial statement fraud can be overstating your net income or understating your net income. Now, Tala gave a good introduction of how, where the investigation process sits in the whole fraud risk management framework. My job is to give an overview of what are the standard procedures that investigators adopt. Now, one of the reason is that not in every case an expert is invited. We are not invited in all the fraud cases that are being examined. Mostly the examinations are being conducted internally, in-house. Your head of compliance might be doing it. Your head of internal audit might be doing it. So the purpose of this investigation is that the audience gets uh, an idea of the structure of a process, how to carry out an investigation so that you are making sure that certain key elements are being considered when you are doing it. So what I have done here is that I have divided the approach into five phases. The first phase is brainstorming where you really sit down and understand that how you are going to go about this task of carrying out an examination. You're not a, maybe, maybe not a trained product examiner, you have to do it, so work, you plan out your details. And then you do the actual planning, you develop your work plan, what are the steps that you're going to be following. Then comes the collection phase, that digital exam, uh, for forensic imaging also comes under the collection phase. You collect information, then you analyze that information and you do evidence gathering through that analysis. Based on this evidence gathering, you report and conclude. So this is a cycle. Two activities are interchangeable. You do the planning, you have an idea where the evidences are, what has gone wrong, you are doing some testing. You do the collection phase. During the collection phase, you identify, no, there is another track to it, there is another line of uh, evidence. There is some information that is stored someplace else. Some other people are relevant. So you go back, you change the plan, you do that thing again. You are starting off with an hypothesis, how the fraud might have occurred if you don't already know that or how the relevant suspect might have committed the fraud. You develop a hypothesis and then you start that process. Your hypothesis may be modified when you are in that investigation. So you do that again and you refine your amend your hypothesis, you do the testing again. In some literature, this step is understandably combined into one phase which is called the problem recognition and definition phase. But in this uh, slide you can see a summary that whatever examination either is being conducted in-house or it is being conducted by an expert for examiner, it has to follow this sort of structure, uh, structured approach. A very busy slide but uh, and it is absolutely not legible, I am sorry for that. Uh, but there are different aspects of each of these phases. I will cover them in the coming slides. So this is just a summary to it. In the initiation phase, you have to identify parties, you are uh, defining your scope, you are considering other uh, scope considerations and then in the planning phase, you are laying out what your inventory is, what are the resources, where you are actually going to perform the work and then in the gathering of information, you are targeting all the information that is uh, approachable. Tala talked about uh, the electronic information, you do that, you collect that, you collect hard copy document, you collect human information which is the interview basically and then third party information is also relevant. You know if you are investigating a suspect, uh, if you come across a CNIC number, a simple SMS 27000 gives the person's name and the father's name and uh, you know you might find interesting findings from that, more on that later. 
And then there's the analysis and interpretation phase where you're actually doing the information analysis. It can be a financial analysis, it can be a non-financial analysis. And then you do the triangulation of information. Whatever you captured from different sources, you triangulate it. If you see certain facts are being corroborated, then you come up with a finding. And then you report and you close the project. Certain things in this comprehensive approach are of particular importance, especially in Pakistan scenario where we usually see these are things these things are overlooked. For example, data privacy, uh, insurance, what are the regulatory requirements? We had an investigation where the client has started investigation one year after the, the uh, incident had already occurred. And they had three other investigations that had already taken place on the same incident. Then you have non-forensic specialist usage. You are a fraud examiner, but you are in a pharmaceutical industry. You might need a non-accounting, non-forensic specialist to provide you the relevant insight. And uh, I will share some cases and instances uh, with you later that what kind of non-forensic specialists can be useful. Then you have this uh, electronic, because here someplace. Uh, Electronic information. Tala mentioned that it's a much, uh, you know, emphasizable area. Uh, we had a client who really demanded that I need a smoking gun out of the investigation. And the smoking gun demand was coming one year after the incident had occurred, and the computer was in use by uh, some other staff member. Uh, so the evidence was contaminated beyond uh, analysis. So just coming to different uh, phases. Uh, these slides are busy. I will try to summarize the key points. The brainstorming phase, you're basically identifying who are the relevant parties. Who are the parties that you will be uh, targeting as, either as potential suspects or either as potential sources of information. Then you identify who are the stakeholders of your report. How often, uh, who, are, who will be using your report? Will your report be actually going all the way to the court of law? And there are instances where the organization carried out internally a very comprehensive investigation and they filled up files after files after evidence. And the case went to the court of law, they went after filing the charge sheet, and the case was thrown out. The judge basically questioned the eligibility of the person who conducted that investigation. More specifically, he was a uh, of certain different degree holder and he was holding the position of uh, head of internal audit. And the judge was very particular that he is not a CIA. So the investigation is contaminated. <laughs> then you understand and confirm the scope. This is very important. If you are a practitioner and you have a client coming to you for investigation, you have to define the scope. Because in forensic investigation, fraud investigation, howsoever you frame them, the scope creep can happen very easily. The scope can uh, be very, uh, you know, it can expand based on any finding that you find. And then you initiate the investigation based on your initial understanding. Of course, you do the planning. It is very, uh, it, it's an ins uh, uh, it usually happens that people want to jump into actual examination of documents and everything. But you have to plan it. You have to plan it properly. You devote as much time to adequate planning, agreeing the scope with the, uh, whoever is commissioning the investigation, and you do the work plan in as much detail as possible. So that when you're executing the work, you're absolutely sure that you'll get all the cooperation that is possible from the management. So planning, it will help you define the objectives of the investigation, defining the hypothesis, what are you actually going after, and defining the strategy, how are you going to go about your investigation. So at the end of the day, you achieve the objective of that investigation. The collection phase, this is the most important phase. In any forensic investigation, although we don't have, currently have uh, as much of a legislative um, as, uh, depth that will judge every, every evidence according to its uh, collection mechanism or collection approach. But this is the most important phase of a forensic investigation. There are three types of uh, evidence or information that you are likely to collect. There is hard copy information. This is traditional. It's uh, uh, very commonly known. But it's not necessarily accounting books and records. Hard copy information can also be uh, Form A, Form 29 of a company collected from SECP. You know, just to see that who are the board of directors of that private limited company. Just to see when that, uh, you know, uh, who are the shareholders and what is the other, what is the registered company's address and other information. 
human information, what is the information uh, that you get from the interviews of selected people and the electronic information. This point was very uh, uh, in detail emphasized by uh, Talha that uh, for electronic information you have to consider the involvement of a specialist, discovery specialist who know how to capture and uh, uh, collect electronically sensitive informa electronic information in a forensically sound manner and that is very important. We do investigations which are mandated in the state of New York. The evidence is supposed to be presented into the court of New York. It is being collected in West Wharf. So how do you ensure that it is admissible in New York traveling all the way from Pakistan? These are some uh, protocols that uh, experts know. If you are hiring an expert, well and good, but if you don't and you feel that your investigation is uh, electronically sensitive and uh, then you need to hire an expert. Hard copy electronic information, okay. So in the collection phase, first you define what is your uh, information landscape, what are you supposed to collect. Then you consider the chain of custody. This is very important. because. Collecting something in a room in West Wharf in a forensically sound manner is insufficient. You have to have documentation that speaks for itself. In very simple terms, we call it the chain of custody document. At the place of collection, we take witnesses that, okay, this process was carried out. It imaged the hard drive and then these people were witness to that incident. And then the hard drive, the main hard drive is sealed into a tamper proof bag and kept as it is. Whatever analysis is going to be performed, it's going to be performed on the imaged copy which cannot be modified. And then this sealed bag will travel from person to person, investigator to investigator to eventually uh, the courtroom evidence uh, locker. And all the people who exchange hand will sign off on that chain of custody. So in the state of New York, the document will be admissible if the chain of custody is going all the way down to the collection point to whom that hard drive belonged to. Have you ever wondered that people get uh, framed and uh, convicted for child pornography cases? Anybody can put anything on your hard drive. This is important that you know how that area, uh, how that collection took place. And we have seen evidence being contaminated just because this document was contaminated. Somebody did something, forgot to write the chain of custody, the evidence is contaminated. Even the collection was uh, okay. But at the middle phase, somewhere it exchanged hand and the chain of custody document got lost, the evidence is contaminated. Third party information is always relevant. In, in any investigation, it's not your knowledge of the incident itself that matters, it's your knowledge of the how the industry or how the business is operating that's really relevant. You'll be able to figure out that how frauds are being incurred. Electronic information hard copy information and then human information. These are the different aspects. So what do you do when you collect the information? You have electronic information in the form of image hard drive, you have hard copy information, although hard copy information is also processed electronically. You can't really amend it. We did an investigation, uh, uh, although it's, it has been framed, uh, discussed on the floor of National Assembly so we can say about it. In uh, the railways forensic audit, there were 10 years of correspondence and it was all hard copy data. It had to be processed. So it's not just the hard copy information which will be processed hard, uh, through in a hard copy form. You have to convert it somehow with some analysis so that you are able to analyze that. So all this information has to be analyzed and it is important to revisit the key characteristic of investigation based on initial understanding after you have done the analysis. Before completing analysis, you should assess credibility, completeness and accuracy of the source documentation. And uh, 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 I believe most of you will be practitioners of uh, the firms and uh, there is a standard process of document request list being exchanged with the client. In a fraud examination or in a forensic investigation that document request list has to be uh, you know more complex. Who you are re uh, receiving information from, who is giving it to you on whose behalf, who is the custodian of that information who is handing it over to you, everything becomes relevant. And while completing the analysis, it is important to uh, remember two important concepts. Professional skepticism and information bias. Information bias is that you are 
forming a conclusion based on whatever is in front of you. You are not considering that you may know uh, there may be other information. I will give you an example. There is a person uh, in the company, his brother is a cashier at a certain bank. The person deposits a check into the bank and the, bank, uh, the check is credited into the wrong account. You get that information from the interview, another person corroborated it, it's triangulated, it's fact. But you cannot assume that the brother did that thing. Because there's always evidence you don't have. You can only state it as a fact that yes, the brother is there, that person confirmed that fact. This person accepted in the interview that his brother works over there. But still it does not establish that his brother credited the check into the wrong account. Unless you had some other form of evidence from the bank confirming that fact. So information bias is very important. There are certain things which are confirmed irrefutable evidences, but there are certain things which are not. So financial and non-financial analysis, uh, you have the evidence. I won't go into the other busy tax sites. What is financial analysis? Simply put, first you take your understanding of business and financial process. You do some relationship testing, okay? The uh, receivable strand and the recovery strand, your payable strand and your expenses strand. You do some analysis. What are the numbers telling you? You do general entry analysis. You trace the funds. How are entries being made? What is happening where? What is going on in the suspense account? What is going on in the miscellaneous expense or entertainment and hospitality? You do accounts payable analysis just to find out how the funds are moving with certain vendors. And you can do uh, financial procedure reperformance. You might do recalculations. For example, in financial services, you can do recomputation of uh, certain key analysis. Non-financial analysis. First off, you had the have the witness information, and then you have business information search result, business intelligence search. Facebook can tell you a lot about a person than uh, many other information that you might have in the organization's record. You can. Uh, I'll share it with you. You can just search anybody's phone number and if they have their privacy settings so low, their profile will come up and you'll probably find, for example, uh, in the mutual friends of uh, the CFO and the vendor, uh, their kids are studying together in some university or some well, they, You can form connections from there. So business intelligence is that, sir, we, we do a lot of stalking. And <laughs> so that is uh, one of the factors of forensic uh, uh, work. And testing against policies and procedure. This is not financial analysis. Finding out that somebody was supposed to swipe a card before entering the lab, it's non-financial analysis. It's relevant. It's relevant to the fraud investigation. And obviously, review of email uh, correspondence. Tala mentioned digital forensics. He did not want to confuse you a lot with the review platforms. But uh, the review of email correspondences is also done through specialized tools. Uh, it's not just eyeballing your in, uh, outlook. If you have 24 hour deadline to conclude an investigation and you are handed over a PST, don't expect to do miracles. Because the PST, if you, even if you load it in uh, Outlook, it will take one week to actually index the results so they are searchable. So these, there are complications involved in there. Some tips, for example, non-financial information, it can be very important. I will give you one example. Uh, we had an, uh, we have experience of doing some things in, uh, in the pharmaceutical sector and there is a concept of placebo production. Placebo production is that you carry out a production of, you carry out the actual production and without the drug, the capsule that you eat, like for example any paracetamol, the paracetamol is the drug which is like very little quantity which is sitting inside a whole block of calcium and a uh, 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 what do you call it? It's a tape of sort. There's a lot of process involved. So placebo production is basically you run the whole thing and you arrive at the drug but without the drug itself. In the client that we were doing work on, this process was being used to uh, masquerade or hide illegal production. They were getting drugs illegally, they were producing it and then they're selling off in the name of uh, you know discarding it. So how did we help? We had help from a non-forensic expert. There was a pharmaceutical expert who explained to us what the placebo process is and explained to us that if they are hiding the production, you have to go to the quality control documentation, pick out their files, see the bill of material, and they would have different bill of material as per the standard bill of material. 
So if it was product A, which required X, Y, Z material, they were using product B's name and uh, uh, produ producing the same uh, project. Obviously, the allegation was there 